I'm Dr. G, and for the past 10 years of my life, I've been passionate about all things holistic healing. I've been committed to healing myself and others from the inside out by incorporating some of the most effective modalities for healing the mental, the emotional, and the physical. I've learned that they give us the opportunity to be our most authentic and powerful selves. Heal Thyself is a show dedicated to just that. Today's show is going to be incredible, and I say it every week, of course I do, because it is incredible. Knowledge bombs of digestible information to empower and create clarity on what the highest version of us looks like. Product reviews to provide informed consent so you can buy the safest and best products out there. Better than the first two that I spoke about, and you're getting other B vitamins, which are energizing, right? Get off of it, throw it away. And special guest segments with some of the brightest and most elite minds in their field. So what is that like on my nervous system? Six hours of holding that emotion. Here's the earth, here's the mechanisms and mechanics of an earth when it breathes. We would think much different about that asthma patient that shows up. All to create change in all the parts that make you, you, so we can start healing ourselves and each other. All right, everyone, welcome to Heal Thyself. As always, man, taking the time out of your day to join us. I really, really, really am excited for today's show. You all know how big a part breast cancer, maybe you don't know how big a part breast cancer has played in my life. When I came out of school, it was my number one fiery passion. It still is. I want people to be aware of what breast cancer is and how we can protect ourselves from it. Now, listen, we don't learn men and women, we're never given the tools. So we're gonna learn a little bit, especially it being Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This is the Breast Cancer Show, all right? And if you're a man and you don't think this show is for you, well, you'd be surprised, men do get breast cancer too. And if you're not predisposed to get breast cancer and you're not worried about it, well, I'm sure there's someone in your life who has breasts that we can give this information to. So super, super, super important show. Very special guest too, Dr. Stacy Whitman. Man, she is the leading voice when it comes to oral health out there. We're gonna learn about what foods we should be eating to protect our teeth, protect our gums, and remember, our oral health is connected to our whole body health. So in essence, protect our overall health. She's so knowledgeable. We're gonna talk about things like fluoride, cavities, toothpaste, mouthwash, root canals, man, all the hot topics, all the trending stuff, we're getting into it. I wanna jump into this show, but first, let's hear a little bit from our favorite sponsors. All right, all right, before we get into the show, let me talk about Masszymes for Bio-Optimizers. It's the enzyme that I've been using to help promote optimal digestive and gut health. Now remember, when we are in a stressed state, when we get older, our ability to digest food declines with age. Now, how many of us, I've been guilty, of running around and eating, walking around and eating, driving and eating, taking calls and eating. We're always doing things, everything, but being present with our food. And the consequence of it is that the stress is giving our body a signal to not digest food. And a consequence of that is that we're not producing as many enzymes when we're sitting and eating. And so the consequence of that is that we experience digestive issues like bloating, heartburn, bowel movement changes, whatever it may be. And a lot of us do. So when I'm in a stress state, and I finally sit down to eat something, and I know that I haven't relaxed or integrated the stress from the day, I utilize these enzymes, which are really, really important because they're gonna help our body digest food properly. But you can't just go and get any digestive enzyme, right? They One, they have to be pure, clean ones, as BioOptimizers is. They have to be high quality, meaning that they're full spectrum and able to digest proteins, starches, sugars, fibers, and fats which BioOptimizers is. So for me, the way that I use it is I have this bottle, I bring it everywhere with me. It's in my bag actually in the studio here. And anytime I eat a really large meal, or even a medium-sized meal, or even a small meal if I'm really stressed, I utilize these enzymes to help me digest my food properly and correctly. And when you consume these enzymes, it helps replace the enzymes that your body's not producing because of that stress state. And thus, as a byproduct, your digestive health feels better. You're able to sit down, eat a meal, and hopefully integrate those practices where we're not running around and stressing ourselves while doing it, but sit down, eat a meal, and then feel better in our body so we're not getting bloated, heartburn, constipation, diarrhea, whatever it is. So for my Heal Thyself people, my family, go to www.masszymes.com slash DRG, and you're gonna use the code DRG10 for a 10% 
discount. And BioOptimizers is also giving away free bottles of their probiotic and their HCL formula, which also can be very much so helpful to your digestive health. Talk to your doctor, but check these out, especially if you're suffering with any digestive issues. You may find that they really, really, really do help you. All right, Birch, one of my favorite sponsors that I work with, really, really high quality company, really dedicated to having a high quality product that is pure, that is comfortable, and they're doing good for the world. And I love my Birch mattress. It's the best mattress I've ever had. I sleep comfortably. I love looking at it when I walk in my room. I have such an appreciation for this mattress and the way that it feels and the company behind it. Birch is a premium mattress in a box company. It makes mattresses and other sleep products that are not only extremely comfortable, I can attest to that for sure, but also they're environmentally conscious, which is so important, especially with the state of our world. So the mattresses in itself are organic, non-toxic, they're made in America, four materials straight from nature, organic latex, New Zealand wool, American steel, and organic cotton, all sustainable. And that's important, right? The ingredients. We know that the materials used in beds are the very reason why I stand up on a soapbox and say, hey, you guys need to change your beds because of the off-gassing component and because of the exposure of those chemicals over the life of the bed. For me, an intervention on a clean bed is paramount to our overall health. So when you get a mattress, you're gonna get two comfortable pillows, the EcoRest pillows, they're made of recycled plastic bottles. Yes, recycled plastic bottles. You don't need to worry about BPA, you're completely fine. And anytime you purchase this mattress, you're gonna get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 10, 10 year warranty. And if that makes you nervous to buy a new bed, you get three months, sleep on it, try it out. If you're not a fan, guess what? Birch is going to come, pick up the mattress, you're going to get a full refund. It's worth it, if, especially if you're investing in your health and your comfort and essentially your longevity. I love my Birch mattress. I think you will too. So click on the link below or go to birchliving.com slash heal thyself. You're going to get $200 off of your first mattress plus two free pillows. All right, the breast cancer show. I did a show a long time ago, one of my probably first 20 shows, about almost three years ago. Wow, three years fly by so fast. As you get older, time is just, it's another topic. But in any case, the breast cancer show was a really, really important pinnacle in me giving out information that I learned over time. Now, before we jump into it, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's been six years since I spoke to a giant crowd of women who suffered with breast cancer and were told by their doctors to just go home, go back to their life. Their scans are clear and they're breast cancer survivors after the next few years, five years. And for me, when I did my talk, people were understanding that they didn't have all the information they needed to protect themselves after cancer. But also, over the years, I've synthesized all of the things that are really important for us to do to prevent it. Right, And there's no hard line in the sand saying, do this and you will prevent yourself from breast cancer. It, we are still unfolding the story of what cancer is. But really, I'm proud to give these recommendations and tips to people so we better understand how we can prevent ourselves. Because breast cancer, I've seen it firsthand. My mom passed away from it. It is a nasty disease. And my mom's not the only one. A lot of loved ones' moms have died from it. I have a close friend whose mom was given three months to live recently. It is a story, the story, the story we've heard from our immediate family, from our extended family, from a friend of a friend. We just hear it all the time. And it's such an important topic. So I'm really proud to be giving these updated uh, numbers and updated interventions and really everything that we really need to be talking about to protect our breast, men and women. Okay, so before we jump into it, I want to bring in some light about where we are with breast cancer in the United States. So as per breastcancer.org, here are the updated statistics. One in eight, one in eight women, about 13%, will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of their lifetime. This year, an estimated 281,550 new cases of invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed in women in the United States, along with close to 50 thousand new cases of non-invasive in situ breast cancer. That's when it's still within the capsule. About 2,650 new cases of invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed in men. Fellas, we are not immune in this year, 2021. And as men, our lifetime risk of breast cancer is about 1% in 833. About 43,600 women in the United States are expected to die 
in 2021 from breast cancer. That's 43,600 too much. Death rates have been steady in women under 50 since about 2007, but they've continued to drop in women over 50, a good thing. The overall death rate from breast cancer decreased by 1% per year from 2013 to 2018, and they're thought to be results of treatment advances and early detection. I have some more important statistics. As of January 2021, there are more than 3.8 million women with a history of breast cancer in the United States. That's incredible. And that includes women who are being treated and women who have finished treatment. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among American women. And in 2021, it's estimated that about 30% of newly diagnosed cancers in women will be breast cancer. And it became the most common cancer globally as of 2021. So when I was in school, it still was not the number one most common cancer. Breast cancer accounts for about 12% of all new annual cases worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. And the last statistic, a woman's breast cancer risk nearly doubles if she has a first degree relative, like a mother or sister or daughter, who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And less than 15% of women who get breast cancer have a family member diagnosed with it. So what the heck is going on? What's playing the role? Well, genetics plays an important role. As I mentioned, 85% of people have no family history of breast cancer, which is incredible. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but you heard about the BRCA2 gene and it is incriminated in about 20% of hereditary breast cancers. One copy of the BRCA2 gene, you have about over a 69% lifetime risk of development. So this is where genes do play a really important role in getting tested for this gene, BRCA1 or BRCA2. But it's not just isolated to genes, right? And genes interact not only with the environment, but each other. The environment is epigenetics and each other is epistasis. But when it comes to our genes, it is the epigenetics that plays a really, really important role. We know just generally, blanket speaking, 5 to 10% of cancers are genetic on their account. But as I mentioned, 85% are the non-familial part. So that's the epigenetic aspect. So I want us all to be empowered. This is very empowering information. I read all these scary statistics, right? Listen to this. Most people are going to have an 85 plus percent empowerment aspect to their cancer. Most cancers are not hereditary. Let's talk about the risk factors for breast cancer. Age, of course, it increases with age, we know that. It's low before 30 and then it increases linearly till about 80 and then it plateaus. Let's talk about geography. Well, yes, that plays a major role. That's the epigenetic aspect, the environment, right? Not just the geographical environment, but also your thoughts, your words, your action, how you interact with everything. But there was a study that showed the people immigrating from Japan to Hawaii basically assume the rates of cancer in that geographical aspect within one to two generations. That's incredible. So if you're coming from a place that has relatively no cancer and move to the southern part of the United States, it, you may assume an elevated risk within one to two generations. It's incredible. Alcohol intake, yes, it does play a role in breast cancer. Body mass index plays a role in breast cancer. You have a 34% increased risk of death from breast cancer. Waist circumference is a very important indicator. What else elevates your risk? Hormone replacement therapy, right? That's exogenous synthetic hormones. Usually the risk falls at about five years after. Radiation plays a role to breast cancer. If you got your period early, plays a role in breast cancer. What else? If menopause is late onset, right? So think about it. You get your period early, your menopause starts late. You have an increased risk years more than the average of an increased exposure of estrogens. And a lot of these breast cancers are estrogen dependent. You'll hear of something called ER positive, that's estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Large majority of breast cancer that we're seeing and it's elevating being estrogen receptor positive. And there's many different reasons and I'll go into it. But yes, increased exposure of estrogens, it could be endogenous and exogenous. If you're pregnant over 35, elevated risk. Okay, so those are the risk factors. What else can we do? What can we empower ourselves with doing to remove from our life or add into our life to start protecting us, right? So here's the interventions. I'll say Lise Auschler in my field is an incredible doctor and uh, she is one of my uh, really mentors when it comes to breast cancer. Back when I was in school and in my residency, I read all her books. And before I'll jump into these interventions, if you have cancer or a loved one has cancer, I would look up her work, Lise Auschler, A.L. 
S C H U L E R, Lise, L I S E. And she has incredible books out there, but also I would look on the database called Onc AMP. This is the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians, oncamp.org. There's a database, and you can type in where you are, and you can find doctors who specialize in this in your area or out of state but near you. A lot of them are doing telemedicine now. So before I jump into anything, I wanted to say that some empowering information because I get a lot of DMs about, you know, Dr. G, my mom has breast cancer now. What do I do? My I have breast cancer now. What do I do? So here's some important interventions. How do we start protecting ourselves right now? Pick a day. Pick a day out of your month to check your breast. We don't do this enough. You have to pick a day out of the month, come out of the shower, make it a habit, stack it with other habits, whatever it is, lay in bed and learn. Watch a YouTube video and learn how to test and check your breast for lumps. And if you do have a lump, which is very common, or lumps, understand which are the lumps that you need to really be concerned about and which ones are the ones that are probably gonna go away next month. What you'll know and probably be surprised that the area that you're checking for your breasts are not just around your nipples, but around the whole breast, under the arms. So I want you all to be experts in checking your breasts. So make sure you do that. Now, what else? Make sure that you get your mammogram. So it's very controversial. I will say this. I don't worry about a mammogram the first year, the second year, the third year, the 10th year. What I worry about is the lifetime elevated risk of breast cancer. When you are doing your mammograms when you're 60 and 70 and you've been doing them since you were mid-30s, early 40s, then that's a conversation that we should be having about how can we reduce the risk of radiation to the breast. Now, you can discuss this with your doctors. There are some people that do ultrasound and MRIs instead. Thermography is an adjunct to those imaging studies. They should be done with them, not instead of them. Thermography is something very powerful, and I'll talk a little bit about it later. What else do we need to do? Alcohol. Alcohol is inflammatory. Alcohol ruins your DNA. Alcohol is indiscriminate. It will inflame your whole body and it is one of the most damaging and preventable things we can do and stay away from. So really important. These are obvious things, right? Smoking, of course, like alcohol, it's mixed the increase. It does increase your risk slight, but others do also. So what we have to think about is this. Alcohol can have a slight increased risk depending on how much you drink. Smoking has a slight increased risk depending on how much you smoke, but you have to think about epigenetics, all of the factors together, and what does the whole summation of the risks look like? All right, what about BMI? I mentioned that. The reason why it's important to be at a good weight, especially when it comes to waist circumference, is because when you are overweight and you have extra adipose tissue, right? what you're doing and creating is extra gonadal, meaning outside of the ovaries, bioavailable estrogens. And remember I was talking about estrogen is a driver of so many of these estrogen-dependent breast cancers. But what else? It's also associated with high amounts of insulin, really important at creating that inflammatory environment in our body. And it's also increasing insulin growth factor, which is an increased risk of breast cancer in itself. So when you're creating this environment, right, with an elevated waist circumference and elevated BMI, it's a problem because you're creating the inflammatory environment of which cancer loves to thrive in. So very important is to get into a healthy weight for yourself where your muscle tone is really, really good and the fat tissue is at a low level because now you're reducing and causing an anti-inflammatory environment in the body. So important when it comes to breast cancer risk. Exercise, naturally as important, both aerobic and anaerobic. There was different randomized controlled trials, but we see it reduces insulin, increases immunity, balances your hormone, reduces inflammation, which is so, so important. Now, what type of exercise? I mentioned aerobic and anaerobic. You want weight-bearing exercise, but also one that gets your body moving and sweating. And we found that vigorous exercise reduced the risk more than moderate exercise. Get to the gym about three to five times a week to reduce your risk of breast cancer. If you do look into hormone replacement therapy, look into other options outside of synthetic hormones. Talk to your doctor about bioidentical hormones if you really do need exogenous hormones or estrogen. Check your hormones. I'm such a fan of the Dutch test. It's such an empowering test because you can see what your estrogen levels look like, but you can also see how estrogen metabolism looks, right? It's really important the 4-hydroxyestrone to be in check between 7.5 and 11%. It's such an important indicator for me as a practitioner to know this patient here is predisposed to breast cancer. 
Her mom had it and her sister had it. This person needs to be taking this test two to three times a year so I know at the very least that 4-hydroxyestrone is in check and balance and she's properly metabolizing estrogen in her liver. So, so important. Now, what else? I mentioned this before. Remember I was talking about exogenous estrogens, estrogens outside of you that are dictating the way your body's reacting and it's acting like a hormone in the body. Xenoestrogens, plastic and dairy are so, so important to reduce and or get them out of your life if you are predisposed to breast cancer. It's so, so, so important because these are the very things that disrupt that estrogen metabolism and increase that amount of carcinogenic 4-hydroxyestrone, which I just mentioned about, one of the most important interventions you can do. Reduce those personal care products preventatively now. There's 81,000 different chemicals in our environment. The EPA only tested a small amount. We have organs of detox, yes, but again, environmental toxins, I spoke about this so much ad nauseum at this point. I know y'all are sick of it, I'm getting sick of it, but really that cup is filling up and a big part of it is a lot of this stuff. So take an inventory of your bathroom, of your kitchen, of your living room. How can you make the air in your house cleaner? How can you make the products that you're putting on your skin cleaner? Have a doctor, get a naturopathic doctor, get a functional doctor. Uh, go on that website, who can test your nutrition? your toxins, your heavy metals, and your hormones. Have them work with your conventional doctor. And what you have right there is a very empowering team with very empowering information that can change your trajectory with breast cancer. All right, so what are some more important interventions when it comes to breast cancer? Diet, of course. We found that the most protective diets against breast cancer were a vegan or a vegetarian and Mediterranean diet. So super, super important. That's what we see in the data. Uh, basically reducing the processed inflammatory foods and upping the whole foods, upping the colors of the rainbow. So when you change your diet, it automatically is reducing that risk of breast cancer. Stress among the environmental toxins, like I said before, is going to be a very important intervention at reducing that inflammatory state. Remember I mentioned before, insulin resistance. This is where that weight part came in, but also the foods, right? Insulin resistance is so, so important when it comes to reducing the pro-inflammatory state that is carcinogenic, that is pushing cancer. You're changing the landscape of your body, so you're creating a place where cancer is not thriving or growing, right? You also want to talk to your doctor about insulin growth factor one receptor, right? Things like magnesium, cinnamon, fenugreek, even fasting can help balance this. So again, your body is becoming more sensitive to insulin. If you're insulin resistant and overweight and stressed and eating a really poor diet, you're mixing up that cauldron of those ingredients to create breast cancer. Furthermore, on insulin, we see in Hong Kong, breast cancer increased by 50% in over 1,500 subjects if food was consumed after 10 p.m. at least once a week for more than a year versus those who did not eat food after 10 p.m. Why? Well, it's because our body works on clocks, right? And at night, our body's not expecting to have big meals. So what's happening in these subjects is that breast cancer naturally went up. Why? Because their cortisol went up, their melatonin went down, their insulin went up where it's creating that landscape where cancer has all the ingredients to thrive in. Fasting super important. You can reduce your blood sugar, which is so important. I mentioned that. Women with a history of breast cancer who fasted under 13 hours had an increased risk of dying from breast cancer by 21%, which is an incredible number over here. Versus those who fasted for 13 hours and over, every two hours of fasting lowered their hemoglobin A1C, which is their blood sugar. So think about it. Super important. We have to think about landscape when it comes to breast cancer, right? Inflammatory landscape, poor blood sugar control, right? Our immune, there's immune dysfunction going on. Cortisol is creating more inflammation over time. So we also see the benefit of small dinners. And some of my favorite foods for breast cancer prevention are the cruciferous class of vegetables. And that's things like horseradish, kale, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, Broccoli sprouts, so, so important. At, remember, going back when I was talking about estrogen metabolism, it is going to help detoxify that carcinogenic form of estrogen and help the liver create a healthy balance of estrogen in the body. Now, the caveat to that is if you're eating all of these really good foods, you gotta be pooping. If you're not pooping, those bile acids are recirculating and promoting cancer in the body. So what's happening is if you're constipated, it's creating 
an estrogen-like effect on breast cancer, which is why it's so important to be eating good quality and good amounts of fiber. So it's moving your bowels, right? Both soluble and insoluble fiber. That's why it's so important to be going to the bathroom and why gut health is such a major topic is because when it comes to the context of cancer, we don't want to be recirculating the very things that we're trying to get out of us. Overall, with diet, reducing added sugars, reducing preservatives, reducing refined carbohydrates, trans and saturated fats, eating organic foods, reducing those pesticides, right? Reducing heavy, mat heavy metal rich foods. Soy, when it comes to that, the myth is that soy really does push cancer. It's not true, it's very protective. We see that in the studies. In humans, we see it, that it is safe to be eating soy after you've had cancer, particularly because soy acts as a phytoestrogen, meaning that it helps reduce or block those very estrogens that I was talking about when it came to xenoestrogens like plastic or dairy, the very ones that are pushing or acting like estrogen in our body. Well, soy is able to help block that receptor, which is really, really, really cool stuff the way nature works. Now, the caveat of all of these studies when it comes to soy and soy being awesome was done in young Asian women, which can have many confounding factors, especially in Asian society that tend to be more healthy than American society overall, eating better food, uh, having a lower stress lifestyle. So there could be many other factors that play to this, but for the rule of thumb right now, soy is safe if you've had cancer. What else? Inflammation. I mentioned that's, that is the whole aspect of the body, right? We want to increase NF-kappa beta so we can do that and reduce inflammation by things like turmeric, resveratrol, quercetin, genistein, which is in soy, EGCG, which is in green tea, food rich in selenium, foods that are rich in dim, right? So I mentioned green tea. Man, that is one of my favorite things for breast cancer prevention. Green tea contains EGCG, that's epigallocatechin gallate, and it inhibits tumor processes and proliferation. So it helps protect our DNA. It reduces angiogenesis, meaning the blood flow or the creation of blood vessels towards the tumor that is feeding it. It reduces that process and it acts like an antioxidant. It's amazing stuff. Sleep. If you're not sleeping well, you're increasing your risk, especially if it's post-menopause. Seven hours to four hours is a major increase in risk. Melatonin and cortisol, you want to balance that, making sure you're exposing yourself to dark pitch black. Melatonin is a super important uh, anti-cancer and it antagonizes cortisol. So at night, you get tired because melatonin is high, cortisol is low. And morning, you wake up because cortisol is high, melatonin is low. You want melatonin to be booming at night, but you need a pitch black environment. You need those signals in your body. We saw that in night shift workers, the World Health Organization looked at this in 2007, Night shift work was a probable carcinogen, meaning it probably causes cancer, night shift work. And it's really important because it's, it's shifting our biological rhythms such that our body's not knowing what the heck is going on. And when it's supposed to be tired, it's not. When melatonin is supposed to be high, it's not. When insulin is supposed to be low, it's not. When cortisol is supposed to be low, it's not. And that's what's happening in the body. We had an Israeli study that showed that women sleep longer, who sleep longer, reduce the risk of breast cancer especially closing your shutters reduce the risk of breast cancer. So if you're exposed to artificial light or near strong illumination, you actually have a significantly higher risk of breast cancer, which is crazy to see that. What else? Vitamin D, you want it between uh, 60 but not above 82. That's a lower incidence of breast cancer versus those who had under 20 as their vitamin D level. And of course, we talk about this for all cancers across the board, not just breast, social isolation, not feeling like you belong to a community, not feeling loved, not feeling like you're part of a tribe, not having a sense of purpose in life are all risk factors. Just because they're mental emotional doesn't mean they're not as strong, if not stronger, than even a really poor diet. So what else? Less studied. EMFs, we're starting to see more studies and, and, and curiosity around what that does with breast cancer. Come back to me in a year or two. Oral contraceptives, a lot of people ask about this. Now, there's a lot of observational studies for breast cancer. There's a 7% increased risk versus those who never used uh, oral contraceptives in their lives. And it goes up to 24% if you're currently using them, risk of breast cancer. But the risk drops uh, at about 10 years after. 
And gut health. You got to make sure you have good health, good gut health in particular. It's helping detox, stimulate immune system, increase nutrients in the body. So really important stuff. And I mentioned uh, before, I'll talk thermography. I think everyone should be having yearly thermography, not in replacement of any other imaging, but it's really good to see the heat patterns in your body to see if there's increased amount of blood vessels in the body. It's not going to tell you you have cancer, go see a doctor, but it's going to be able to track from a baseline every six months or a year. So get that imaging, especially if you have a family history of breast cancer. So that whew, is the 2021 Breast Cancer Show. I really hope this helped you out. If there's anything that was uh, too much or too complicated, just reach out and I'll be glad um, to answer you. Just reach out. On, and if you don't, just email me, info at and I'd be happy to help you out. Or if you just want me to hold any space when it comes to you and uh, if you have breast cancer or if a loved one has breast cancer, I've been through it and I can help as much as I can. I cannot give medical advice, so please don't look for that, but I can lead you in different ways. All right, let's get to Dr. Stacy. I'm going to be so excited to talk about oral health. Yeah, I'll know that I went to dental school for a little bit because I love teeth. And uh, what she's going to do is drop some amazing bombs. But before we do that, here's some words from my favorite sponsors. All right, so you heard me talk about the importance of having rituals in your day. Part of my morning ritual is to make some sort of warm drink to wake me up, right? And today I brought some turmeric powder where I make my turmeric latte every single morning. But I don't just use any non-dairy milk. It's important, especially if I'm going to be making some sort of latte or tea every single day, that I'm utilizing a high quality milk. So this is the one that I use, Willa's Honest Goodness Oat Milk. It is the best one that I have found to date. One of my first shows was on oat milk, and I highlighted how the oat milk industry is not making good quality oat milks. So it's created by two sisters, Christina and Elena. And they felt the same way as me. Basically that what the heck is happening in the oat milk industry? Why are the ingredients and nutrition facts on oat milks such poor quality, right? You'll see some oat milks that have non-organic oats. A lot of them do. But if they do have organic, all of a sudden they have really high sugar. A lot of them do. And if they don't have high sugar, then you'll see different oils like sunflower, safflower, canola, rapeseed oil, all creating an inflammatory environment in the body. And then on top of that, a lot of them are having thickeners and emulsifiers, which for people like me are going to react, especially if you have a sensitive gut. So Willis Oat Milk across the board, my favorite one, USDA organic label right in the front. Then you move to the nutrition facts and it's amazing. First thing my eyes go to is the ingredients, filtered water, not just water, great organic whole grain oats. Very important if you're eating anything that has to do with oats that you're getting organic. They are sprayed with desiccants, meaning drying agents that are really, really nasty to our health, especially if we're having it every single day over time and are giving it to our kids. We have organic real vanilla extract and salt, simple ingredients. Now, one of the most impressive parts of these nutrition facts is that a lot of oat milks have a ton of sugar. When you look here in the nutrition facts, one gram of sugar and eight fluid ounces, which is the best of the best. What you don't see here is any inflammatory oils, gums, thickeners, and lastly, phosphates. Phosphates are found especially in cafes, and they can really have an effect on our gut as well. None of that in here. So I'm gonna show you. I usually fill up my tea to about a quarter to halfway of the cup, depending on how I'm feeling that day. There's a brand new batch over here, opening it up. Usually I shake it a little bit. I shake it before I got on air. And you'll notice that the oat milk is creamy as it is without all the sugar. I mix it up with my spoon. And then as part of my ritual, I'm not at home right now, but as part of my ritual, I go outside and take my walk around the block with my latte. And when you first taste Willis, you'll be surprised because it has a thick texture but it's not overly sweet, which is amazing. So this is my favorite oat milk across the board. All right, so let's take a sip. So my favorite part of Willa's is that you're not overwhelmed with that sugary oat milk taste, but it also is full bodied to make my latte a latte. So if you wanna check out Willa's oat milk, across the board, A plus my favorite oat milk, you can go to willaskitchen.com, Amazon, and select specialty retailers. All right, what an amazing guest we have on coming up. 
But very quickly, I want to talk about something really, really cool that I've integrated into my life. It is the Ned Sleep Blend. Ned is my choice for CBD across the board. We know that a few years ago there came out this report that was investigating the quality of all these CBD products. And I was shocked to see, and you'll be too if you Google this investigative report on CBD products, most of these companies are really, really poor quality. And when I first connected to Ned, the first thing I did was go on their website and see if they had these certificates of analysis available for the public. And guess what they did? And not only did they have it just for the CBD, but they had it for every ingredient, also not CBD, in the bottles, which is amazing, right? So for the sleep blend, I was able to see all of the herbs that were in there, the synergistic herbs, and the quality. Super transparent company, amazing product. Now the Sleep Blend has been a lifesaver. It is the only supplement that I use before bed. Now they just came out with a de-stress blend that I've been integrating. It's basically a one-to-one -one formula of CBD and CBG. It is potent, it is pure, it is full spectrum, and it has a botanical infusion of ashwagandha. How many of us, I mean, I always get questions, is ashwagandha good? It's really one of those herbs that are super popular. Super, super important when it comes to the way that our nervous system is reacting to stress, the way that our body's releasing cortisol. Ashwagandha is, man, since school, been one of my favorite herbs. It has cardamom and cinnamon also to help balance out the whole formula. I mentioned it's a one-to-one -one CBD to CBG. CBG is actually known as the mother of all cannabinoids because it is super effective when it comes to combating anxiety and stress and inhibiting the reuptake of GABA. Now, GABA is that neurotransmitter that makes us feel good and calm and safe. It is the neurotransmitter of stress regulation. And I did mention the cardamom and cinnamon. It adds to the delicious taste, right? A lot of botanicals can be really sharp or bitter. Cinnamon is actually a powerful prebiotic, and I bet a lot of you did not know that. Really important for gut health and a key player for inflammation and mental health. And the cardamom combats stress and helps reduce your blood pressure and cortisol levels. So if you want to try out the new Ned De-Stress Blend, which everyone can use. All of us are stressed. Are you in America? You're stressed. It's amazing stuff. Try it in the morning, try it in the afternoon after lunch. It's a brand new product. I love it and I trust it. But from a super high quality company, we had the founders on here. Just check them out and see if you align with them, their energy, their amazing, amazing stuff. So here's a special offer for Heal Thyself audience, as always, right? Every order over $40, you're gonna get 15% off and a free de-stress blend sample. You're gonna go to helloned.com slash DRG and enter DRG at the checkout. That is H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash DRG. You're gonna get 15% off plus a free de-stress bland sample on any order over $40. Hey, all right, everyone. Very special guest we have today. You know uh, my story and how I went to dental school and how I had a fascination with teeth and how it connected to our bodies. But now we got an expert on here. So I can't wait to dive deep with Dr. Stacy Whitman. She's a board certified dentist who practices functionally and holistically, just like we love it here in Heal Thyself. But really, we're gonna dive into how the oral health connects to our full body. And if you have cavities like I did when I was a kid, and almost every tooth, it was really crazy, uh, especially with the American diet that we're eating, can we reverse those cavities? So we're gonna find out all about all of this with the expert coming from Portland, Oregon. Yes. And I've been to your beautiful place. And I remember I met a chicken. Uh huh. And, yeah. and I took a picture with it and then, or video. And then right when I'm taking a video, the chicken starts flying and I throw the chicken and you run away. You were not into it. You put a city boy in the country holding a damn chicken. I know. I almost had a city boy heart attack you in there. You had a moment. I had a moment, but it was very <laughs> special. So actually, whoever was listening or viewing and remembers that story that I put up, it was at your house. It, yes. Amazing. Um, I just mentioned that I went to dental school. We, you and I bonded over this. Yes, I was fascinated with your story. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. But how, because I know how the curriculum is in dental school. Wait, and you went to first Minnesota. year? Uh, first year and another semester. Okay. So three, three semesters. Okay. I know how the curriculum is. A lot of people don't. Yeah. How the heck do you end up going into functional dentistry, which is not part of the curriculum? Mm -mm. At what point was this moment in school where you were like, I actually want to do something different? Good question. Well, first of all, thank you so oh, much for, sure. for having me. For I'm sure. a very big fan of everything you do. Thank you, Doc. Um, and I really admire it. So it's an honor. Well, I can't say I had my aha moment in dental school because I was so in the weeds. But um, I'll be honest, dental school never really resonated with me, which is why I connected with you because you recognize that 
and change their path. But I didn't, um, I guess, have the courage to do that. So I kind of stuck with it, um, but never really felt fully satisfied or fulfilled with dentistry as it was being taught. And I practiced for a few years, but it we were always addressing end-stage disease and never really getting upstream yeah. and at root causes. And again, I just didn't feel fulfilled. And I myself practiced um, traditionally, but I lived a more clean, holistic lifestyle, if you will, um, to the best of my abilities at that time with the knowledge I had. But um, I think what really propelled me into it was I lost my mother suddenly um, to lifestyle issues. And that really got me thinking, like, how can I personally live a healthier, more optimal life? And then how can I apply that to my patients too? Mm -hmm. And so I was an adult dentist for years, but I again realized, man, I'm just not getting to the root cause of this. How do I get as upstream as possible? And that's with kids. And so that's when I went back into school and went into pediatric dental program. Again, it was very traditional. Yeah. But it took a while for me to finally have the courage to just change my practice model. Mm. Um, in Dr. Stephen Lin's book, The Dental Diet, was a huge, huge moment for me when I read that book. I realized I wasn't a lone wolf. There are other dentists out there speaking this way, practicing this way. And then it gave me the courage to open the practice I have now in Portland, uh, where we definitely do things differently. Yeah, and the way I love it, yeah. right? Because it, the tie between us is even through naturopathic, through naturopathic or fun functional or biological dentistry, we're all getting ahead of it. Yeah. It, that's the whole point, right? Yes, hopefully. Functional medicine, we're all, hopefully that's the goal to get ahead of it, but also work with the body, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at things before they develop. And I know, and you know, and I've, I've tried to do oral microbiome shows really to the best of the ability, but now I'm so happy to have an expert here. Yeah. How important is this bacteria or the whole flora in our mouth compared to what we used to think? It, has the research changed? And what are the implications? What's happening in our body with it? And how do we feed it? And how do we nurture it? I mm -hmm. want to know all about all it. All of it. All of it. Because for me, it's something that is, it's a travesty how little we talk about it. In in medicine too, not it's just coming. not just yeah, it's coming. not just that is yeah. I, I want that tidal wave to come because it, people are going to be shocked. Yeah, um, but I want let's let's dive deep into that okay. because we talk about gut health and microbiome. It's time to talk about oral health, body health, microbiome. It's very related, gut health and oral microbiome health too. So you asked how important is it? I think it is paramount. It is the most important thing is our oral microbiome. So where we were taught, I was taught as a child, it's all about avoiding soda and candy and brush your teeth with fluoride toothpaste, right? Well, we'll get to that later. But it's so much more than that. It is about supporting your healthy, uh, beneficial microbiome orally, but in your gut too, because they are like cousins. We mm. consider them kissing cousins, mm -hmm. if you will. So most dental disease, whether it's gingivitis, gum inflammation, or dental cavities is because of an imbalance or dysbiosis in the mouth. And there are many reasons for that. And that can be certainly how we're breathing, what we're eating, and our hygiene too, as well as nutritional quality. So like uh, micronutrients, mm -hmm. especially like trace mineral deficiencies and things of that nature. So I know in naturopathic medicine, you focus so much on healing the gut, but a lot of patients I find they won't get to optimal health and we don't know why. Why are they hitting these brick walls? And a lot of what we're missing is looking into the mouth and what is the oral microbiome like? Very often patients have gum disease, or dental cavities. And as you mentioned, you experienced this as a child. You know, dental cavities, dental caries is the number one chronic disease in children in the world, mm -hmm. you know? And it's something that a lot of us think, we just get cavities. That's just part of being a human, but it's not. And we know ancestrally, we look back 10,000 years ago, humans didn't have cavities. It was really rare to find a specimen with cavities. Mm -hmm. And it's really been since the agricultural revolution, the industrialized revolution, and the change to our food system that we now have all this decay. So for me, part of it is educating families and parents about the true root causes of some of this disease. And it's not lack of hygiene as much as you think. It is certainly not lack of fluoride. 
it is imbalances to our microbiome. And so how do we support that? And we can dive deep into Mm. that if you'd like, but it is something, my whole goal is to get the mouth back into the body to kind of make dentistry cool again, Mm -hmm. to get working with our medical colleagues more so that we can really help patients support true optimal health. Mm -hmm. I love that you said the part where we optimize the gut health, but if they have oral disease, Mm -hmm. it's still not optimizing the whole health, right? And kissing cousins is a cool way to put it because yeah, yeah, they're they're very, very much so intimately related. Yeah. When you think about, I mean, man, when I was a kid, I had, I, I felt like be going to the dentist for a checkup always led to getting my teeth filled a few weeks later. And that didn't feel good, right? There's I emotional implications. Yeah. I, emotional health is so important. That's my number one goal with my patients is to support their emotional health so mm-hmm. they don't have this negative memory of the dentist. Mm-hmm. And how do we stay ahead of that? It's through prevention. Yeah. So you mentioned a few things. So first I want to talk about how caries or cavities happen. Uh, is it is the main mechanism behind it the imbalance of the oral bacteria? Mm-hmm. And if so, then what happens when those pathogenic me- bacteria are overloading your system? Yeah. Is, is it, how, how, is that, how is that causing the decay? Sure. A uh, great question. So generally, to really simplify it, it's acidity and inflammation. So most pathogenic bacteria in our mouths, they are anaerobic and they love acid. They love an acidic environment, and that can be created through how we're breathing and what we're eating. So highly processed foods, fermentable carbohydrates, sugar, starches, um, those things will lower the pH in our mouth, and then eating frequency too. So those of us who tend to snack or graze or sip all day, that leaves our mouth in a constant state of acid because that's part of the digestive process. And when we talk about gut health, I consider the mouth actually part of the gut. I mean, it's the entryway into our body. It's kind of all, all one system. So, um, and we're swallowing so many times. We're swallowing 2,000 times a day. We're swallowing all that bacteria. What is that doing to our gut health? And there's still a lot of research that's happening about that. I do think uh, the oral microbiome is going to blow up in the next few years. Mm -hmm. But the way a cavity is caused, so day in and day out, if you are allowing this acidic state, you're allowing these pathogenic microbes to flourish, what they do is their byproduct is more acid. And so they stick as a biofilm onto your teeth and they release acid. And hopefully if you're in balance, your saliva can come in and neutralize and remineralize with calcium and phosphorus and things of that nature and trace minerals. Mm -hmm. But if your hygiene's not on par, if your diet's not on par and this is happening day after day, eventually you lose minerals from your teeth due to that acid Mm -hmm. attack and eventually you'll get a hole in your tooth or a cavity. Mm. I mean, it's similar with gum disease. Gum disease also can be a sign of nutritional deficiencies. But again, that acid, if it's from the biofilm, it's released, it causes gum inflammation, irritation. You get bleeding gums or leaky gums, which is what we're trying to coin that phrase, like Mm -hmm. leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So now you have this way for pathogens to get into the bloodstream And that's where we're seeing a lot of links to systemic issues, Um, heart disease, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's, dementia, the list just goes on and on Mm -hmm. and on. So I just, we can't emphasize how important it is to support your oral health, but really we're trying to dig dig deeper with the research on the oral microbiome and protocols to help rebuild that if if it's been affected Mm. and is in a dysbiotic state. Interesting. So when you have a oral microbiome that is flourishing, Mm -hmm. what does that balance look like? Because are the commensal bacterias stopping the growth, just like the gut, stopping the growth of Mm -hmm. the pathogenic or controlling the growth of pathogenic bacteria? And are the commensal bacterias, their byproduct is not acid? Correct. Right. Correct. So that whole concept, we like, we want to disinfect the mouth, right? right. That's the whole marketing thing that happened with um, you want SLS, like foamy, you know, frothy mm-hmm. toothpaste. Well, we know SLS is trashing mm-hmm. our microbiome. Mm-hmm. And um, we want minty and lots of essential oils. Well, again, those are antimicrobial, but they're not selective. So this whole idea of like disinfecting the mouth is incorrect. We don't want to disinfect the mouth. We want to support 
the good guys is what I tell the kids that come to see me, but are beneficial bacteria. Um, and they have a really protective role. They can help communicate and transport calcium and phosphorus and minerals. They can protect our teeth. They serve a very important purpose. Um, so if we're constantly disinfecting our mouth, we're stripping away all this beneficial bacteria and leaving uh, room for this negative bacteria to take over, but also just susceptibility to disease. We really, especially with our product choices, we really recommend less is more. So trying to clean up our products, looking at the ingredients. I know you've done a lot of talks about mm -hmm. your favorite toothpaste. Mm -hmm. Rinses, be very careful of a lot of these rinses too. Um, you know, fluoride, we can talk about fluoride more yeah, later we'll go into in it for depth. Sure. But fluoride, part of the marketing and promotion of this is that it's antibacterial, but it's not selective. So what is it doing to our helpful bacteria? Mm -hmm. You know, so we really need to be mindful what we're putting in our in our mouths and what agents we're putting in them because it can be doing more harm than good. A hundred percent. I I love that we're understanding it from the commensal to the pathogenic mm -hmm. and how they keep in balance. So in a, in a good mouth, and correct me if I'm wrong, commensals are there keeping the pathogenic ones in balance, mm -hmm. giving or helping the enamel get all of the essential nutrients that it needs to stay strong. And helping the remineralization Helping process. remineralize, yes. okay. Every time you eat, the pH is going up and down. Correct. Okay, and then it's holding the guys back who are creating those biofilms yes. to start breaking down the teeth. Yes. So naturally then, the question would be like, how do we up-level our commensal oral bacteria? Right. Well, diet is huge. So um, being mindful of processed foods, highly palpable foods, like sticking to whole foods. It's my catchphrase at my office is eat the rainbow. Mm -hmm. So a lot of phytonutrients is really important. Prebiotic fiber is critical, just like the gut. I mean, it really mirrors the gut. So a lot of the recommendations you might make to a patient to support their gut health, yeah. it will support the oral health too. So we love prebiotics. If we feel like um, we're not getting enough natural probiotics through fermented foods, we might recommend some really high quality supplements. And there's more and more companies targeting specific oral probiotics that are, are um, mm. benefiting the specific microbes in our mouth that we need because mm. there, there are different niches in the body, you know. Um, tongue scraping can really help too. I love to see patients tongue scrape and floss mm -hmm. um, just to reduce the pathogenic bacteria again. But breathing is critical as well. And I know you've had experience with this yourself mm -hmm. and that may be why you had so many cavities as a child. If we mouth breathe, um, we're changing the pH, we're changing the microbiome because we're drying our mouth out. And our saliva has so many protective enzymes and nutrients in it. So we do see a huge uptick in dental disease in patients that are mouth breathing. Yeah. So I would say diet, airway um, is, is, is critical. Yeah. Is critical, yeah. yeah. And then stay away from the snacking because then you're reducing that pH. Eating frequency, yeah. So a lot of kids come in, you know, a lot of these snack foods are made to kind of nibble on throughout the day. You know, uh, you're, you just never are satiated. Mm -hmm. So... Every time we eat, part of the digestive process is the pH lowers in the mouth. And so if we are constantly nibbling, grazing, sipping, we're constantly in a state of acid. So we do like kids and adults to get on scheduled eating. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like just like intermittent fasting. You want to let the gut and the digestive system a chance to rest. Mm -hmm. It's very important for the mouth too. Mm -hmm. So we you know, try to say eat every two to three hours very consistently um, as opposed to the snacking, the grazing, because yeah. the kids that graze and snack, even if the food choices are maybe quote unquote healthier, they're still dealing with this constant state of acid. Mm -hmm. I say the same thing, like even if you're eating healthy in the gut, what that's doing is stopping something called the migrating motor complex. Right, yes. So you're not even cleaning out the gut if you're eating, you know, every three hours or less, mm -hmm. you know, even preferably four hours between meals. Um, I think that was me when I was young. I yeah. was always nibbling, always eating snack foods that we Same. had in the drawers. And then on top of that, there were crappy foods. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, you know, it was funny. I know my dad listens to this show. <laughs> Sometimes my mom would be like, oh, you go brush your teeth. It's time to brush your teeth. And, I'll, and I used to be like, fine. Like I used to resist it so much because I hated it. Many kids do. And then I yeah. close the door and I'd pretend I'm brushing my teeth to spite her. I've heard it before. Yep. And I wasn't even right. And then, no. then I, not knowing that I was being affected by it. But um, it's just, it's funny because I ended up with so many cavities. That's such a bummer. Yeah. It was like, I remember the office. I remember where it was facing. I remember the drill. I remember when the dentist would come, like my body would just tense up. Oh, 
Of course. It's really invasive. That's the other. So part of the way I practice is to be as minimally invasive as possible too, because there are so many adults with true dental phobia. Yeah. Um, and I experienced that. I was an adult dentist for a few years. And I, again, I was like, man, I can't do this. I can't mm-hmm. do this my whole life. What am I going to do? And mm-hmm. I was like, how do I get upstream? I'm going to go back. I'll go back to school and mm-hmm. I'll start working with kids mm-hmm. um, because they don't have the fear yet. And it doesn't have to be so scary. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of remineralization protocols and try to heal cavities, which you can do. And I can go into my protocols later. But yeah, I mean, we, if we look at ancestral humans, they weren't brushing and flossing. They weren't using fluoride toothpaste. Mm-hmm. It is just so much about the diet. I mean, it's, it's just so interconnected. And unfortunately, you know, it's the food industry, yeah. you know, and that's what needs to change. And so... Um, A lot of this can be so overwhelming to parents. So I just, my goal is just to support and guide and try to give really uh, attainable nuggets Mm -hmm. that you can take home and kind of chip away at, just like when you're on like a health journey too. Um, So don't get overwhelmed, parents, please. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so we got mom and dad listening. Yeah. And they go, all right, listen, my kid hasn't had a cavity yet. Uh-huh. Great. But but my friend's kid just got their first one. And my friend's friend's kid and my brother, their kids are starting to get cavities now. How do we get ahead of it, like you said? Mm-hmm. Where do we start? Aside from the food, is there a certain type of toothpaste that you like? How often should we be flossing? Uh-huh. Should we be using mouthwashes? If so, what type of mouthwashes? Great. All of these questions, we got to know. Okay. So first recommendation is as soon as a child gets a tooth, it can get a cavity. So that does mean we need to start implementing some sort of oral hygiene routine. So that can be at six months old. In fact, you can even start earlier by just wiping the gums. That can help desensitize children. So you can just start with water initially. I really think we are over product in the dental industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. But I am a big proponent once you start introducing toothpaste of hydroxy the appetite toothpaste, mm-hmm. and I've heard you speak of this too. Mm-hmm. I can put in the show notes my favorites. They're mm-hmm. the same as yours. Mm-hmm. Boca and Risewell are the ones that I really like right now. Although there's room for improvement, I think, and I'll keep you I, po- I have the Boca one. I'll keep you posted about yeah. that. I use Boca too. My kids use Risewell. Risewell, yeah. I, I tend to just have both like circulating. You flip them around. I flip them around. Yeah. Why not? There's another one too that I think doesn't get enough press. It's Revitin. Okay. And it has uh, prebiotics and coenzyme Q cool. and vitamin C in it. Cool. It doesn't have the hydroxyapatite, but I switch I switch up that one too. Okay. But I don't... I, so my big, big mantra at my office is floss. So almost all cavities I see in children are between the teeth. It's not from lack of brushing, it's from lack of flossing. So I do like parents to get in a really good consistent flossing routine as soon as all the molars are in. So it's around two or two and a half. And this includes for adults. So wheat flossing is so important. You guys, periodontal health, and this is where all that systemic issue can come in. You know, Alzheimer's prevention, heart disease prevention, diabetes prevention, a lot of it comes from periodontal, Mm -hmm. gingival health. And so that is flossing. So please start flossing. Those little floss sticks or are fine. I don't like the plastic. Um, I've been trying to work on a solution Mm -hmm. for that, but stay tuned more about that. We can put it in the show notes too. Um, I think you can tongue scrape with kids also. You know, I love to tongue scrape. That can help your oral microbiome as well. Cleansing the tongue of of bacteria and like food particles. Um, Kids think it's hilarious. So Mm -hmm. don't be afraid to try it. Um, but I really like tongue scraping. I'm not into rinsing very much. I think most rinses are overkill. They're filled with essential oils yeah. and additives that really can disrupt that delicate microbiome. If you're going to do it, especially if you're in imbalance, I do like like a sodium bicarbonate or just baking soda rinse. If in a lot of kids won't tolerate that oil pulling, I mm. oil pull. I don't do it every day because there is an antimicrobial quality mm. to the coconut oil, mm. but I will do it a few times a week. But again, I just think it's less is more. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating a really clean diet and you're not eating a lot of starches and carbs and processed foods, hygiene really can be pretty minimal. So Mm -hmm. I'm not advocating for not brushing and flossing, but again, it just comes back to it's so much about the diet and hydration and breathing, you know? And, and, And not overkill, like you said. Not overkill. It's interesting. Some people go, I've never had a cavity in my life and I brush like every morning and that's it. Oral microbiome. 
They have a great microbiome. They have a great microbiome. And so at my office, uh, our intake forms take about 45 minutes to finish because we dig deep and we talk about the maternal health. What was the labor and delivery like? Was Mm. it a cesarean? Was it vaginal? Do they breastfeed? Because all of these things can affect the microbiome. And that doesn't mean all hope is lost if some of these things didn't happen for you. It's just good for us to know Mm -hmm. so we might know how to support you or your child after. But there it is. I mean, you can say, quote unquote, that's the genetic component. But again, just like epigenetics, nothing is set in stone. And so our environment can really affect in our microbiome and the quality of our enamel and things too. Mm. So don't feel if you have a family history of a lot of cavities, you know, or gum disease or anything like that, that this is in your destiny. You have control over it, definitely. Can I ask you a question then? What are, how do you feel about xylitol? Because so many people are saying that you should um, be eating xylitol chews throughout mm-hmm. the day or, or the mints. Mm-hmm. What's your take on it? I have mixed feelings about it. There needs to be more research. So from a strictly dental perspective, there is research to support that it inhibits bacterial proliferation. So it can help reduce cavity risk. There are concerns when you're swallowing xylitol that it can affect your gut health too, Mm -hmm. right? So as with a lot of those artificial sweeteners, like what is stevia doing? What is monk fruit doing? I think... We're, you know, jury's still out. So I'm not, I don't, I don't really promote it a lot personally, just because I, I'm not confident of what it's doing to our beneficial bacteria. Mm-hmm. We kind of know what it's doing to the pathogenic bacteria, but what is it doing to our beneficial bacteria? Mm. So I think there, I, I, it's not, it's not one of my go-tos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for answering that because I know it's like a kind of hot topic that's rising up. A lot of people are talking about it. There's like, over here in the local market, there's like a xylitol area. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I, this is a question I got for the it's, doc. It's part of a lot of protocols. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it can be successful. But again, I just have concerns about what it's doing to the to our gut health, our GI health. Okay. Now I'm going to get comfortable because I know we're going to talk about fluoride now. Okay. Oh, my gosh. And, and, <laughs> and, and I want to know... <sighs> I think one of my, what is it, episode maybe four or five, like I did it on fluoride. Oh, did you? I need to one of my first shows. Okay. Uh, and look, I maybe uh, things have may changed in the past three years, maybe okay. not. First of all, what is your take on fluoride? Is it essential for our oral microbiome or our teeth health? Are we overusing it? Um, what about the fluoride rinses that, mm-hmm. that we're supposed to get? That I was getting the bubblegum one when I was a kid saying you need to too. take that. I had it too. Um, What's your take on it? Because there's, there's like, anytime I talk about fluoride, some people are like, it actually, it, it, I've gotten like DMs from dentists saying like, there's not enough research to say what you're saying. And also it helps my patients who who have fluoride rinses, they their cavities go away. So they're standing really strong by it. I want to know what you think, because fluoride is such a big topic that we hardly talk about anymore. It's so triggering and dividing. So let's start with systemic fluoride, okay? So there's systemic fluoride and there's topical fluoride. And systemic is what you ingest. So that's either water fluoridation or prescriptions. And topical are fluorides and rinses and varnishes and things you have done at the dentist. So the argument of the dental community is usually there's not enough evidence and that this works and it's one of the biggest public health movements, you know, all th- those are the arguments. But there's actually a lot of data just in the recent years to alert concern, you know, to elicit concern. We need, I really believe we need to be having conversations about this. So um, there are about 64 studies, many of them are excellent studies uh, that are showing increased level and increased correlation with ingested fluoride to IQ issues, neuro neurotoxicity issues, mm-hmm. bone health issues in children, in maternal health. And you can go on the Fluoride Action Network if you want to actually see these studies, and I can list some of them in the show notes. So my concern we, we know, okay, fluoride might remineralize teeth. We know that. Great. But what is it doing systemically? So let's look at it on a more macro level. And for me, when I'm speaking to a parent about this, 
I can't look them in the eye and say that this is the best thing for their child because I don't know confidently what it's doing systemically to them. Mm -hmm. And there's so much data now to be very concerning. There's actually a lawsuit happening right now in San Francisco. It's the people versus the EPA, where it's the first time a federal judge has said, okay, dental community, we get it. You like fluoride and it, it, you, you, you're saying it works on teeth. It remineralizes and makes them more acid resistant. Great. I want to hear from this expert panel about the, the systemic concerns. Um, and it's like epidemiologists and biochemists and researchers that are presenting information. And it's, it's fascinating. I've read some of the excerpts from it and their testimonials. And so he's hopefully making his decision in January, where he might decide to take water out the Florid, fluoridated water mm-hmm. out of San Francisco, which will be a monumental case. Mm-hmm. So there's many concerns. I mean, there's an ethical concern. Number one is we're giving a medication to patients without their consent, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And also, you can't control the dose. So we can control the concentration, but we can't control the dose. Right. So we've actually recently lowered the concentration because they realized we were getting too much. So um, they estimate about 40% of teenagers have fluorosis, which is when you've received too much fluoride. And I see it in my practice all of the time. It will look, the teeth will look mottled. Um, they'll be chalky. And honestly, they can be more brittle and affected that way too. So... The, the judge, we hope in January makes the right call, but the concern really is beyond the teeth, right? So what is it doing to our, to our children and to our bodies? And so I really encourage parents to go read this research and make their own, their own decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't control the dose. So like, let's say you drink fluoridated water and you are a marathon runner and you drink two gallons of water a day, and I barely drink any water, and I drink a cup of, mm-hmm. of water a day. And then you're also cooking with it. You're cooking your pasta with it. You're making your soups with it. You're making your smoothies with it. You're getting so much fluoride. And on top of that, with kids, they're brushing with it. They're swallowing with it. They're swallowing their bubblegum rinse. Right, right. They just get too much. And so what is that downstream effect? And that's where all this research is coming in. And, you know, some of these experts are comparing it to lead. You know, there are th- there are some theories, too, that actually fluoride can help when there's water fluoridation happening. It's going through the pipes, and it's a lead pipe. It can leach lead out wow. of the pipes more. Wow. It's, just, it's, it's concerning. And I d- at least would love our colleagues to just have a conversation about it mm-hmm. and be open-minded to the research because it is there and it is quality research and there's a lot of it. And I'm hopeful that fluoride will at least be removed from our water at some point. You yeah, know? at and the very least. At the very least. I think, I really believe it's the right call. And there are better, we're not fluoride deficient. So fluoride is not an essential nutrient. There's no fluoride deficiency. You know, ancestral humans had no fluoride and mm-hmm. we seem to evolve just fine. Our teeth were beautiful. Mm-hmm. Again, it is so much more about the diet. And personally, I feel fluoride is a bit of a Band-Aid. It's almost that prescription model. Yeah. I don't have time to speak to you about the details of changing your diet. I don't have time to assess your airway health, how you're breathing. What's the easiest thing for me to do is I'll write your prescription for fluoride or I'll put some fluoride varnish on your teeth. Mm -hmm. And we have such better options out there now, which is like hydroxyapatite, which is what I recommend patients to use in their toothpaste. Fantastic. Great answer. I love hearing that because the fact that we can also shed light on something else that can really is worth looking at, especially in our colleagues who can read the studies and then put it into practice is really important. I wouldn't get like hateful DMs, but I get people to be like, okay, but like it works. It does work. And that's, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a hard conversation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, sometimes when you question water fluoridation in particular, you get pegged into this like woo-woo group. Immediately. And it's like QAnon and like chemtrails and it's like, come on, you guys. I just want to help support my patients. I don't want to be in my 90s and 100s and, you know, looking back on my career and, and saying, man, did I contribute to some of these issues, these IQ issues, these yeah. these yeah. neurological issues in kids. 100%. When I know it's not because we're fluoride deficient. That's not why we're getting cavities. It's it's because of the way we're eating. 
It's what we're eating. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's how we're breathing too. There's so much mouth breathing and nasal congestion and airway and sleep issues too. And I would actually recommend, since we're talking about breathing, everyone go listen to the episode that I did with Dr. Zaghi. Dr. Zaghi. Which is where you just came from. You just came from the Breathe Institute. Yes, I'm training at uh, to be an affiliate of the Breathe Institute here in LA. Yeah. I, I, one of like, I guess Dr. Steven, when he first came on, he was like one of the first 20 episodes we ever did. Yeah, he's a good friend. He's the one who brought it to light. And I was like, breathing, mouth, Mm -hmm. oral healthcare? Mm -hmm. I was like, how's it? Oh my God, it makes sense. And then after that, he opened this door and then met Dr. Zaghi, another passionate dentist like you. I was like, whoa, like this is so important, the breathing element. But- you know, that's a whole nother convo, but everyone go listen to Dr. Zaghi. Please listen to it because I can't. I mean, he nailed it. I he listened to it. it and it was perfect. So, yeah. yeah. It, it, and he was just like talking about like, he was even if, if, on video, he was like clenching his teeth, opening his mouth. You yeah. Know, like he was, show, he was like the showing mentalis- with the tongue. Strain. The mental- he was like very animated with his face He's doing so it. great. But that's passion. Oh my gosh. His passion is palpable. palpable. I just, yeah, it's amazing. He's doing wonderful things. So... What I will ask you about, because my first ever show was on uh, amalgams and mercury. Yeah. Our, oh man, okay. This is, uh, let me, for, I'll preface with this. I had 12 amalgams. Okay. 12 throughout life. Yes. Uh, uh, each, each one, four on each row. In no, per- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Do, do, uh, in had, permanent had, teeth or no, primary no, teeth? Uh, on, on my permanent teeth. Uh-huh. No, I had three, I had three, six, nine, I, I think it was. Three, three, four, and two, or something mm-hmm. like that, or, or three, three. But all my molars had. What do you think about them? Are they, are they truly a as much of a healthcare risk as we're learning about? As people saying, um, do they leach mercury, vaporized form yeah. in our saliva into our into mm-hmm. our body, or do we have heavy metal toxicity to them? Is there a safe way to get them out? Yeah, I, all the things. I do not place any mercury fillings in my office. It's Mm -hmm. never even been in my office. I have concerns with alloy fillings. I don't like fear-mongering, though. So when I say this and you happen to have mercury fillings, I don't want you to feel this panic. Because I I think some of us, just like kind of with root canals, some of us can do pretty well and our immune system can handle it and tolerate it better than others. But personally, you know, I had one alloy filling too and I did have it removed. Mm So yes, there's concern when you're chewing, when you're grinding, when you're eating hot liquids that some of the mercury can be released. Um, And there's some uh, data to support that through like blood tests. Dentists are the highest risk population of having mercury toxicity. Right, it makes sense. Yeah. So again, this is one of those things like we took it out of our thermometers. We make recommendations about what fish to eat and not eat. You know, mad hatter's disease, but mm. yeah, it's okay in teeth. And that's in such close, close proximity to our brain. You know, I just, again, there's better materials out there. So if you're at the dentist and you need a new filling, I absolutely would not choose a mercury alloy filling. And if you are having a tooth where the filling has broken or it needs to be replaced, mm-hmm. I would choose an alternative material. I definitely have concerns with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think we can do better. Uh, the other thing, one of the selling points of mercury fillings is that it's antibacterial. Okay, it's not selective. Right, all bacteria. All bacteria. It's that same thing. We're just disinfecting. It's the same with fluoride. Like, that's great. It's killing just generalized bacteria, but it's it's creating a potentially more of a state of dysbiosis, you mm-hmm. know, because it's killing some of the healthy bacteria in our mouths too. Mm-hmm. So. Makes, it makes sense. Uh, as an alternative, is uh, are you, do you look for like plastic, ceramic? What what? So what are I'd recommend ask for? asking for a BPA, BGMA free or ceramic based material. Um, the one I use is Admira Fusion. I can't say there's a perfect dental material out right. there. You just do the best you can. And so that's the best one on the market right now. And with crowns too, you know, zirconia crowns, ceramics is kind of what I would recommend gear, leaning toward. But again, we're really just trying to prevent issues to begin with. If you're listening as a parent with children, you know, a lot of these conversations don't need to apply to you if we can just make sure your kids stay healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It's crazy to just think about how many uh, amalgams that people have. And and there's so many. I it, I think it's going down now mm-hmm. with the generation. They're but, still man. teaching in dental school, though, which is shocking. So, in September 2020, the FDA came out 
This should have been front page news. They came out and they said, now there are certain populations that should avoid mercury fillings. Mm. And it included pregnant women, children, uh, people with autoimmune disease, and then my favorite, people with mercury sensitivity, Mm. which I would think would be everyone. 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 (laughs) So, you know, I do think for them to come out and make a blanket statement, no more mercury. Mercury has been banned in other countries, by the way. Mm -hmm. And also, let me go back to fluoride. 97% of the world is not fluoridated. Mm -hmm. So this conversation is a very U.S.-centric issue, right? But yeah, I mean, I I think they're worried about making such a blanket statement because there could be litigation. There could Mm -hmm. be a lot of upheaval in that. You know, I I wish um, we could have more transparency, but... I remember when we were just working with, uh, we were doing the fillings on the the dummies, the mm-hmm. the, the, the dummies. The type on. Yeah, the type on. So oh. you made it to that part. I did. We, <gasps> did you, you have loops? When you said, uh, yeah, I did. I, have, I had really cool ones. Oh, you were in it. Yeah, I had like really like nerdy thick glasses one glasses loops, and then they were just like. I would love to have you sit next to me and type been, it on class. It would have. Well, you would have seen my clunky hands messing <laughs> up on everything. What I noticed the difference between me and. Uh, my colleagues was that they were so much more detail oriented and very particular Same. and can work really well in small spaces. Engineers. Yeah. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. engineers. Yeah. I noticed that that's not my brain. Me neither. I was an art major. I'm a theater kid. Right. I was like, what am I doing here? Right. How did I end up here? I that, still wonder. That was me. I was like, <laughs> I was like, is anyone, can uh-huh. I, do you need like a spokesperson for the school? Don't. Maybe I could be the spokesperson. <laughs> Maybe I could be on a commercial. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Right. I'm just trying to be the face of functional dentistry. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I, and to all, I got love for all the dentists, but God bless you, man. You, you, they, you guys are working in these tiny spaces it's a tough for gig. an hour with your back. No, just it's like, a tough gig. Dentistry's really hard. It's not only hard physically, it's emotionally, mentally draining. Then you're expected to run your own business. Ugh. Then you're dealing with emotional trauma and dental phobia. And, and people don't want to hear. Everyone want to come see you. Everyone hates you. <laughs> I mean, I remember when I was an ad- adult dentist walking in and just, you know, people white knuckling it. And I, you know, I'd be like, hi, mm. I'm Dr. Stacy, as mm. politely and gently as I could. And they were just legitimately mm. terrified. And that's when I said, I can't do this. Oh. I need to get to the kids, I guess. I don't know what to do. So Asi- I do. I have that. As- aside from getting uh, a bunch of cavities filled, I have two, four, six, eight, eight of my teeth missing because it didn't accommodate for my jaw when I was young. Oh, you had orthodontic said, extractions? I had orth- orthodontic extractions, eight. That's like, why it, it just didn't stop. That's, they were your air, just, that's why you're having the airway stuff. That's why. So exactly because, I, and I, I, that's a whole other story. But that's why I really fascinating. Though. Connected with Dr. Zaghi and his work because he was talking about airway. I go, wait a minute, there's, that was me when I was young. Yeah. So real quick on that. Again, parents listening. Earlier interventions better. So crowding, jaw discrepancy issues. Like you can. It's not traditional orthodontics is like you wait till all the baby teeth fall out, you see what you're left with, and a lot of times you're extracting permanent teeth and making the jaws smaller, and that's affecting your airway. So find a dentist who will work with you early, and I mean like starting two, three years old, like getting in there because you can control their growth and development and get them back on track. Yeah. And so that's what I do is like we intervene really early at my office. And it was interesting when Dr. Zaghi like was talking about the characteristics of a child who is mouth breathing. Yes. I was like, wait a minute. I like, I know people like that in my school. I remember like that very particular oh, facial structure. You can see it across the room. It's called adenoid facies. Usually mm-hmm. it's like the dark circles, mm-hmm. the forward head posture, the long face, the open mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really distinctive. I want to ask now, naturally. I mean, look, if you're here, I'm going to try to get all of the goodies yeah, from, bring from, it. from the brain here. Okay. You mentioned root canal. Now I'm going to tell you a story. Uh-huh. I have a loved one who um, their health was... I would say maybe going down, but slowly going down. Um, started getting better, doing better with gut health, like lifestyle, all the stuff. But he had like warts on his fingers hmm. and they wouldn't go away. They'd like extract them and then they'd grow back, extract them, grow back. I'm talking about two years of just warts. And towards, the, I think it was like the month of April, where he had a root canal on his gum started swelling and swelling and swelling. I'm talking about like within a day, it just, there was a huge bubble there. Yeah. He immediately went to the dentist. They go, we got to take the tooth out. They took the tooth out 
in in two weeks the warts, warts were went all away. gone. Sure. I, and in that moment, I was like, oh, okay. well, your skin's your biggest organ, mm-hmm. right? I mean, okay, root canals. Are we ready? I mean, listen, you're here, and I'm <laughs> asking you the tough questions, but we got to know. So again, I don't want to be sensational and say all root canals are bad. I do think it's very technique sensitive, and I don't think there are many out there doing the ideal technique. You are very lucky because here in LA, there is an endodontist who's an integrative endodontist, and she's doing amazing things with root canals using ozone and laser therapy. So we can put her name in the show notes too. Mm -hmm. It's Valerie Cantor. What, What you do for a root canal is you go in and you remove all of the vital tooth structure and the pulp, which is the center of your tooth and down into the root structure. So you're basically like mummifying an organ. So your your teeth are vital. You know, they are living organs, which many people I don't think realize. So you're kind of creating this dead tooth, this dead organ, which can trap and harbor bacteria and fungus and yeast and all of these things. And again, I think it's all about technique, and then it's all about your terrain, like your immune support. So can you tolerate kind of this underlying chronic inflammation, bacterial load? Mm-hmm. Some people can and some people can't. And so I think if you're suffering from a lot of autoimmune issues or just fatigue or you just can't get to the root cause of a lot of your health issues, you absolutely should be looking into your mouth and at your root canals and seeing a biological dentist who could do a very detailed like CT scan of the mm-hmm. area and really assess it. And very often it is recommended just to take them out and hopefully get like an implant or a replacement in that in that regard. So so a lot of people uh, have the, look, a lot of us have our immune system overwhelmed as mm-hmm. it is, right? By yes. virtue of so many stresses, chemical, physical, mental, emotional, our, our immune system All is always taking it. To understand, what the, when they mummify the tooth, there, there's a chance that there's still bacteria in there? There always will be bacteria. Okay, there will always be bacteria. You can't sterilize a tooth. You a can tooth. disinfect a tooth. And how are, how are you disinfecting it? And I... A lot of the agents used in root canals are concerning. They still, in baby uh, pulpotomies, is what they're called, baby root canals, they use formocreosol. It's formaldehyde. Mm-hmm. They, I know, it's crazy. They will use MTA, which has aluminum in it. Mm-hmm. Gutta percha has barium in it, mm. you know? So you really need to find someone that's using clean materials. A lot of times they'll use bleach. And so the data really supports that, but you have to be so careful with it, you know? And and again, what is that doing to our microbiome overall? Yeah. So I... I really love ozone. I'm a big fan of ozone in dentistry. I use it in my practice, even in pediatrics. And there are endodontists or root canal specialists out there that are using ozone in their root canals and laser therapy, which is much more biologically sound and really clean materials, like biomimetic materials, like things that are kind of like calcium derived. And so Mm. doing your research, it does help. So, uh, which is concerning as is, because I didn't know about those disinfecting agents. Yeah. Uh, Especially in like young children. Kids, I know. Like teenagers. So then when you have this mummified tooth, uh, at some point in a lot of people who have issues with root canals, there's a regrowth of those pathogenic bacteria. Mm -hmm. And now they're just boiling under the surface. They're stuck down there. They're stuck down there. Yeah. And that's causing constant inflammation Correct. to the area. Yes. And then how is it connecting systemically? Is it through our bloodstream? Mm-hmm. Okay. Lymphatic system, bloodstream. And bloodstream. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then they, we're getting... They, they think too along our nervous system as well, like wow. our vagus nerve and... Traveling. Exactly. So, so which makes sense because why so many people, once they address a, a tooth that is constantly infected over and over for many years, it's so crazy to me that when they remove it, like the wart, which which was as a minor intervention for, yeah. for a wart, I'm sorry, the wart is something more benign when it comes to a disease that can be manifesting for years, like a serious disease that can possibly right. be reduced by just removing like, a root canal. Like cancer, autoimmune yeah. issues and things too. Yeah, I mean, you hear patients report after teeth are removed that are root canal, just amazing differences in their physical mm. health. So I don't don't experience that so much in my pediatric practice because I'm not working with adults, you mm-hmm. know, and so we do really try to avoid uh, root canals as much as possible, even mm-hmm. in baby teeth, mm-hmm. and give the parents always the option to extract the teeth. But we do so much with 
cavity arrest and reversal and remineralization because I I do have ozone and um, it's the best thing I've added to my practice. It's wow. amazing. The ozone really does work. So everyone out there, okay, so there's people listening and viewing, right? They're going to go, all right, well, my kid, my teenager needs a root canal, my kid has cavities, but we can't get in touch with Dr. Stacy. Yeah. She's all the way in <laughs> Portland and I'm all the way in Maine. How how do they find people that are working like you? Great question. I wish I had better news. There mm. are not many mm. yet. I'm working really hard on that. You can go to the Holistic Dental Association. You can try the IAOMT, mm. the IADBM, and then a uh, very good colleague of mine, Dr. Mark Brehenna uh, of know. Ask the Dentist. Mm. Yeah, he's a very good friend and he's so gracious. He's created a functional dentist finder, which is free. And you can go to his website awesome. and check that out or DM me. I'll try to find somebody for you. But we do have people travel from all over the country and even global globally to see, see us up in Portland. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to make a movement, trying to get uh, training implemented for more providers to be able to practice this way. So we just that. stay tuned. That. And, and, and I, I truly believe that there's, if it mirrors anything with conventional medicine and the way that a lot of these conventional doctors are going, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. You know, especially, I think there's just a consciousness shift where we're not taking the same thing. And Absolutely. Even when we're learning school, I mean, like, I ta- one of, there's a, a student at a conventional medical school, second year, who's like, I kind of want to practice like you. And, you know, he helps with medical research for the show, actually. Oh, cool. Shout That's out, great. Shout out to him. Um, but Good job, man. But but what I'm noticing is that he said, like, yeah, you know, I know some people that, like, are really, like, not wanting to step forward and, like, this. This isn't health to me. We need more holistic approaches, yeah. mental, emotional, physical, something preventative. Absolutely. And I, th- I think I know that it's happening a lot in the conventional medicine side, and I'm starting to see it. I, like, it- in dentistry? Yes. It's happening. I agree. I totally Even agree. Even from the outside. You're in it, but from at me looking in the outside, Good. I see the same I'm thing. I'm happy to hear that. It's it's a slow movement, but I'm confident too, especially as some more of like the millennial and Gen Zer graduation uh, uh, generations are getting into dental school. I think there's just more awareness about just health in general, um, and I'm hoping that they become the providers that can help lead the functional dentistry movement. And there's, you know, there's the Institute of Functional Medicine. There should be the Institute of Functional Dentistry. Mm-hmm. You Just know how you do it? Putting that out there into the universe. Fun, yeah, somebody needs to. You know how you do it? You got to get on TikTok and you got to start talking about all this stuff. Oh, I'm too old for TikTok. Uh, that, that, pff, that's what I said. Are and you I, on TikTok? A little bit. Okay. I need advice. I just repurpose a lot. So anything you see on Reels, it's okay. on TikTok. But, okay. um, <laughs> but we'll, ta- we'll talk about that later. You have a floss. That I, I that, I, that I have. Tell us about it. Okay. Yes. I have a few things cooking. So I do have a floss. Uh, it's what I believe is the world's first truly compostable floss pick. And I chose floss picks because kids, it's easier for parents. It's made of post-consumer recycled paper. It's called Happy Floss. Because it's one of a kind, the machinery to mass produce it has never been created before. And so I'm in the investor round. Mm. So I had the pitch deck and I'm pitching to investors. She's a businesswoman too, ladies and gentlemen. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but yeah, so if you know any investors out there, podcast land, mm-hmm. send them my way. But I'm hoping that that can be accessible to people because I part of holistic functional health to me is environmental health. Mm-hmm. And dentistry, there's so much waste. And you think of toothpaste tubes and floss picks and floss and all of these things, you know, plastic toothbrushes. So my my hope is to help with that, with some of these product lines. And then I do have other things in the works to product Uh-oh. related, but I'm not quite able to announce them yet. Okay. But everyone, Stay when she tuned. does, Dr. G is going to get the word here. You will get a big package. And I will, I, I'll, I'll put it all over the it's place. It's really good. I'm waiting on it. I'm excited. Maybe I'll get a little bit it's of really insider good. scoop later. I'll tell you later. Okay. Awesome. 100%. <laughs> awesome. And how do people find you? If you're looking for actual dentistry, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Again, at NOPO Kids Dentistry. That stands for North Portland. And then I'm on Instagram at Dr. underscore Stacy, and it's D O C T O R underscore S T A C I. And I also have a website, Dr. Stacy. I'm going to have some courses, and I have a, I'm working on a book. Mm-hmm. So I'll yeah. keep you all informed. In the loop. Keep us yep. all in the loop. What a pleasure to have you here. I mean, this is really one of the first conversations where we had something really comprehensive, where we got to talk about the oral microbiome. 
Mm-hmm. Fluoride. Yeah. Cavities, root canals, nutrition, mouth breathing. This has been like, we touched on it all and I'm a very, very complete show. And Great. it's a pleasure to have someone who's passionate like you and doing what you're doing in the world because we need more people like that, not only in dentistry, but in the world. So thank you. I appreciate you. And we'll have you back very soon. Thank you, Dr. G. It was right. a pleasure. All right. All right.